All right, um, I'm Gary Wilson, faculty here at the Exotic Animal Training and Management Program. All right. So I'm talking about promoting animal wellness through behavior management. So animals have been maintained under human care for thousands of years for a variety of, of reasons. Um, the practices followed in order to maintain those animals have uh, continued to evolve, steadily evolved, as um, our knowledge and understanding of things have incre increased. So um, we have an animal here to demonstrate um, a couple things. This is uh, Scooter. She's a uh, capuchin monkey. Yeah, you can put it right there. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is that um, one of the things we try and do now is, is promote the animals doing what we call species typical behavior, behavior that they would normally do in the wild. So one of the things that capuchin monkeys do in the wild is that they find aromatic leaves and they rub those leaves on their body. We think this has a function to um, help prevent um, or, or discourage ectoparasites from getting onto the animal, like fleas and things. So um, when we give Scooter this uh, garlic, she, she then rubs this on her body, much in the same way that the, the wild capuchins will rub these leaves on their body. So this is a, a behavior that's totally stimulated just by the presence of this stinky stuff. <laughs> and um, she's going to be carrying around that smell for a while after this. And so will Cindy. <laughs> We were able to take Scooter to the Tonight Show to make an appearance there, and uh, she did this on Jay Leno's desk also. Do you have a walnut to try? Okay. Yeah, you want to wait a little bit? Okay. Another behavior. Uh, capuchin monkeys are a species that we know use tools uh, in the wild. They'll, they'll use rocks to crack open heavy-shelled nuts. And uh, we can see this behavior in, um, in our animals in the zoo as well. So we're going to see if she, if she might do this with a walnut. <laughs> They have capuchin has really strong jaws as well. But uh, when, when she first arrived, and we let her do this, when she first came to America's Teaching Zoo, she would, she would smash the walnut while holding one hand up over her head. We didn't know why um, until we talked to the place where she came from. And they said that one time she was, she was smashing a walnut, and she hit her own finger with it. So after that, she always held that hand up over her head to make sure it was out of the way and she wouldn't hit it again. Didn't have enough garlic on it. In, when we have animals under human care, we typically provide them with food that's really easy to process. Um, compared to out in the wild, they spend uh, much of their time, a majority of their time, looking for food. So sometimes we can make it a little more difficult for them, like giving them a whole walnut like this that they have to crack open. Or um, we can even cover it with a, a wood paste, a wood dough, 
and to create an even harder shell on that. It's cheaper than importing uh, heavy shelled uh, nuts from, uh, from Brazil. So, uh, but it makes, it increases the time it takes the animal to uh, break open that walnut and get at the meat inside. <laughs> She's, that's great. <laughs> Are you going to walk around with it a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So just stay in your seats. Scooter will come up the, Cindy will come up the aisle with Scooter so you can see her. Capuchin monkeys are a South American species of monkey. So one of the characteristics is a prehensile tail. She uh, will typically hold on to her leash with that as she walks. And uh, she often walks on top of the, the chain link fence around the zoo. Sometimes that leash will get snagged on the top of the fence. Um, but uh, Cindy will just tell her to fix it, and she goes back, and, and uh, Scooter will untangle the leash from the fence. They're, they have, um, of all the monkeys, they have uh, uh, the biggest brain compared to their body size. So they're a pretty intelligent species. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so um, at first, when we were keeping animals in captivity, we, the goal originally was just to keep them alive. Um, as, our knowledge of, um, as our knowledge has grown, knowledge of veterinary medicine, knowledge of nutrition, um, we've gotten much better at it. And so now it is typical to expect an animal under human care to live twice as long on average as the same species in the wild. But as our focus has turned from just keeping them alive to actually conservation of the species, then breeding of animals has become more important. So this is a young cub at, um, lion cub at San Francisco Zoo currently. Um, for much of the history of zookeeping, we've been focused on the physical environment, providing the animal with physical environment that they need. We want to safely contain the animal, so it's safe for the animal as well as for the people caring for the animal. Uh, and we've gradually um, improved exhibits to give the animals more and more space. Um, it's been kind of a, a, a game of balance um, if we want to maintain the animals in the cleanest environment, therefore the environment that is the most free of potential pathogens, disease agents, um, we would build everything out of stainless steel and concrete. But uh, concrete's hard on the joints. You're walking on that all the time and jumping up and down. And, um, so uh, we often use natural substrates, dirt, uh, grass, and things like that. And, um, we, but the problem there is those things can, the dirt can harbor pathogens and parasites. Um, so it's a matter of finding the balance where the, the animal isn't um, subjected to too many pathogens, uh, but also doesn't suffer the um, ill effects of being on a, a very artificial environment. We can improve how much uh, activity an animal gets. Um, when we're providing the animals with food, oftentimes they don't have any need to move around, don't engage in as much activity as they would normally in the wild. But through training, we can get them moving. Um, so the, um, even running around, and in this way, make sure the animals get 
uh, at least some exercise. It still may not be quite the same as what they do in the wild, but it helps. As we've progressed to breeding these animals in captivity, then we've had to think about not only their physical needs, but also their psychological needs. Harry Harlow's work in the 1950s with rhesus monkeys um, demonstrated the need for contact for the, for the infant. Um, he was using these monkeys for psychological research, and they were expensive and uh, hard to obtain, and he, so he set up a breeding program to breed the animals. He started following what was then the current wisdom at the time, even for human children, that you, the best, you're going to have the best results if you keep them in a fairly sterile environment. You protect them from potential disease. Um, and so he took these little baby monkeys away from their moms and hand raised them in, the, in very clean environments. But when they grew up and had offspring of their own, they didn't know how to take care of them. They were terrible parents. Um, and so this started him down a path of looking at, well, what was going on? And from his work, we know now that that essential contact with the mother um, for these uh, primates early in their life, very important for developing their normal um, uh, social skills as well, even just normal neurological development of the brain. So we've kind of come to this point where now we're trying to assess the animal's psychological well-being. But we can't ask the animal, you know, how are you doing? How do you feel today? Uh, with um, veterinary medicine, even the, the care of these wild animals is difficult because an animal out there in the wild that shows symptoms of a disease is more likely to get eaten by something. And so unlike our, our dogs and cats who, can, uh, who are more pampered and um, <laughs> can uh, complain early when things are not right, uh, these wild animals hide symptoms of disease, symptoms of problems. They try and hide it as long as they can, and this is, makes it difficult for us to care for them. You have to admire the work of veterinarians. First off, they have a patient, they, they can't tell them what's wrong, but then with these uh, exotic animals, they often are trying to hide even what's wrong, so it's difficult to assess. So, <clears throat> what is psychological well-being? Uh, in 1985, the Animal Welfare Act was amended to require people in, the, in this country maintaining primates in captivity to have a program to, uh, to promote the psychological well-being of those animals. And so this was especially directed at, at a lot of the research labs where they have thousands of monkeys. Um, and while good intentions uh, and some great things have come out from this legislation, at the, when it was passed, it caused quite a furor because people were going, well, what is psychological well-being and how do we measure it in a monkey? Um, the head veterinarian at the UC Davis Primate Center at the time gave me a good example. He said he has a he has a um, friend of his who is a rock climber whose um, psychological well-being is fabulous when he's a thousand feet up on the face of El Capitan. Okay? The rest of us, in the same situation, our psychological well-being would be in the toilet. Right? Um, so, if psychological well-being can differ from person to person, it's not unreasonable to expect it to differ from animal to animal as well. So how do we, so how do we get at it? Well, what we've kind of come to, to um, agree on, sort of like what I was talking about with, with Scooter, is that we want to look for species-typical behavior. 
You want to try and create an environment where the animal can engage in behaviors that are typical of that species. And of course, this is going to vary from animal to animal because they have different, different requirements and different needs and they do things in different ways. We also want to see an absence of abnormal behavior. And that in and of itself, abnormal behavior is a difficult thing to um, characterize. Um, we are typically thinking about things that the animals don't exhibit in the wild. But in some cases, we've, our knowledge of what the animals do in the wild hasn't been extensive enough to know what their whole repertory of behavior is. Um, so for example, for a long time, um, people caring for gorillas in captivity would see this um, behavior of they'd eat some of their food and then, then throw it up, vomit it up, and then eat it down again and do this repeatedly. And uh, it was thought to be this is an abnormal behavior. Um, it certainly looks abnormal. Um, certainly if a person was doing it, you would say that's not normal. But as people did more and more studies of gorillas in the wild, then they started to see this behavior in wild gorillas as well. And so it's not so much, it's certainly abnormal for a person, but it's not really abnormal for a gorilla. It's probably, probably related to the high plant content of their diet. This helps them, uh, almost like a, like a cow chewing its cud, helps, it, helps them process this plant material better. Well, here's an example of species typical behavior that I got to see recently. Um, I was camping in uh, Red's Meadow near Devil's Post Pile in uh, the eastern Sierras, and this uh, wild coyote came into the meadow where the, where the horses and mules were um, grazing. Now watch when he, he detects something he's looking for. Look at the tail starts wagging. He's So he was looking for prey, looking for ground squirrels and mice and things in this, in this field. And you can see there, it takes him quite a while. I mean, this was, this was a half hour or so into uh, him looking around. And you'll see here, he does catch something. I didn't catch the actual moment of it. But you'll So he can smell it, he can hear it, he's trying to get it, or he can get at it. And yep, there it is. So <laughs> doesn't spend a, spend a whole time eating it, just swallows it down. So. And then went on foraging some more. So one of the strategies that we've used in, um, uh, with animals under human care is uh, to present the food in a little different way than just uh, dumping it out or putting it all in a bowl or something like that. Um, one of the things that we've done with primates, for example, is to scatter seed um, in the, their exhibit or even mix it in with uh, a straw so that they, uh, they'll spend time, it takes them a lot longer to go and pick up the individual grains um, than if you um, provided the, you know, gave them a granola bar or something instead. So they spend more time um, engaged in this activity, which is more like what would happen out in the wild. So we call doing this kind of thing behavioral enrichment or environmental enrichment. Two terms are, are really synonymous. Different people have different philosophies on, you know, are you enriching the behavior or are you really enriching the environment? But same thing. The person that we really associate with this is a guy named Hal Markowitz. Um, Hal was a professor at UC uh, San Francisco 
and uh, in the 1970s did work at the Portland Zoo in uh, providing enrichment for the animals in a little different way. In, um, uh, we're going to talk about his work with Gibbons, and he, he documented a lot of this in this book, um, which was published in 1982. So let me talk about this, one of the things that they tried. This was, uh, they had um, a group of white-handed Gibbons. They, the Gibbons lived in a cage. You know, Portland Zoo gets pretty cold there, so these animals were housed inside. Most of the primates are, tr are tropical. So they need a warm environment. And so this cage was typical of the time. It was it had a concrete floor, had tile walls, and a chain link fence front, and then had uh, steel bars, steel uh, pipes erected inside uh, for the animals to swing on. So a very artificial environment. The group that was in there included uh, an adult female named Mama, and then her offspring, uh, Harvey and Khalil, were two juvenile males, and then Squirt was an infant. So Markowitz and his people wanted to encourage these animals to do species-typical behavior. Gibbons are known for their acrobatics in the trees. They're excellent brachiators, swinging hand over hand in the trees, even flinging themselves as much as 30 feet through the air. Um, high up in the canopy of the rainforest. So you wonder, though, uh, this was possible for them to do in the enclosure, but the, uh, they had no motivation to do it. The, um, typically, they were fed once a day just by putting the food on the ground. Um, gibbons in the wild uh, never come down to the ground if they can avoid it. Uh, they spend all their time up in the trees. They, um, when they, if they do come down on the ground, they, have a, they walk on their hind legs because their arms are so long and they just hold the, the hands up and try and balance as they walk. Um, they even do that on branches, but they, if they, can, they really don't want to come down on the ground if they can avoid it. So what Markowitz did was he um, installed in a, there was a couple windows in the back of the enclosure. And so he installed this apparatus, so a, a light that was protected from the gibbons damaging it, and then um, a lever and a few food chute. So he automated this uh, by uh, taking 35 millimeter film leader and, and gluing it together and make a continuous strip. So he made a conveyor belt, and then you just put pieces of food on this conveyor belt, and what would happen is the light would come on, and the gibbon could pull the lever, and then would turn the light off, and then a piece of food would drop out. The conveyor belt would turn a little bit, and the piece of food would fall off into the, uh, right where the lever was. So it taught the animals to use the lever um, by first putting food there, and then getting the animals to associate the light with the food, and, and shaping the behavior of pulling the lever and turning the light off. And then they put in a, another window a second light. And then what happened was they changed the situation such that the, the light would come on at the, at the second window, and the gibbon would have to go up there, pull the lever, and that would turn off that light and then turn on this light. And so the animal had to swing over to this, this one, the one that knew where the food was, pull the lever there, turn off the light, and get the piece of food. So um, this worked to stimulate the behavior, but not in everybody. Um, the um, uh, Harvey became so good at the task um, that he could do the whole thing in less than two seconds. Um, Khalil, his brother, and Mama only occasionally completed the sequence themselves. Instead, what they would do is they would wait for Harvey to go to that first light and pull the lever, and then they would race to the second light and pull the lever and, and get the food. Um, if um, Harvey's behavior toward the other two animals was different. 
So if it was his mother who got there first, he was okay with it. Um, but if there was a chance that his brother would get there uh, before he did, he usually didn't do the behavior. He would just, the light would come on and he would look at where his brother was and then he'd, he'd either pass on it or he would try and make it before his brother could get there. Um, another shot of him leaping. So the, um, this encouraged the animals to engage in this species typical behavior. Um, and then they, they installed a coin box that the public could put dimes in. There's a graphic explaining what was going on and, and explaining that they could put a dime in the box and that would start the sequence. Uh, and so that kind of randomized when the apparatus would go, when the lights would come on. If no one, if there wasn't any public around, then every, at a minimum of time, the, the light would come on and start the sequence. Um, but um, Markowitz and his people were surprised that after a year, they made $3,000 in dimes from this thing. They tried a similar experiment next with some Diana monkeys. Um, this group include, had the same kind of cage uh, as the gibbons, but uh, included a 16-year-old female, an 8-year-old male named Rocky, and an adolescent male named Butch, and then um, Beulah's infant male named Kid. And here they added a little wrinkle uh, to it. They, instead of the animal getting food when they pulled the lever, instead what they got was a token. And then they could deposit the token in this apparatus and, and trade it for a piece of food. So here, um, the, the researcher is putting a coin out, one of these tokens out, so that um, the animal would touch it and then they let it fall into, the sh into that chute and then a piece of food would come out. So the animal would learn the connection that putting a token into the device earns them a piece of food. And then in the, um, then higher up on, in the enclosure, they had, um, this time they had a light uh, actually clear up at the top with a chain that came through. So the animal had to go up to that light, pull the chain to turn the light off. That turned the light on at a second station where they would go pull the chain there and get a token and then come down to the box and exchange the token for a piece of food. Okay. Um, so the, the female, Beulah, never really um, got the hang of doing the behavior. Um, but she would encourage Rocky or Butch to do it. And so if she was hungry, she would push them Physically, she'd push them toward the station so that they'd go and, and do the behavior. And then she would, when they got to the, the token deposit station, she would let them put the, the token in and push them out of the way and take the food. Okay. Um, the um, Rocky was the best at it, and Butch was a little slower. Um, or other way around, actually. It was, Butch was the faster one. And um, it was how they, it was their technique. So when Rocky would go up and pull the chain, he would then climb down to the other station and pull the chain there. When Butch would do it, he'd pull the chain and then he would swing underneath the, pot, uh, the bar and throw himself to the next station. So it was faster. One day, the, the researchers observed uh, Rocky uh, just sitting and watching Butch do this. And after a few trials of Butch getting the token and the food, then the next time the light came on, Rocky ran up there, pulled the chain, and swung underneath the bar in the same way that Butch did it, and got to the, the, the next light and pulled the chain there and got the token and seemed very proud that he had learned how to copy the other animal. 
I mentioned that Beulah didn't do the behavior herself, but she would encourage the others to do it. And um, she, it was observed one time that um, uh, Butch had done the behavior, gotten a token, and then came down to the station where Beulah was, and he put the token in, and Beulah pushed him out of the way, but no food came out. And this happened like three times, at which point Beulah gave up. You know, it's like putting the dollar in the soda machine and it doesn't give you any soda. You give up after a while, right? So Beulah walked away, at which point Butch took the token out of his palm where he had hidden it and put it in the machine and, ex and got the piece of food. So he had uh, faked his mom out by just tapping the token on the device to make her think he was putting a token in. So it, it got the animals more active and uh, it taught Butch how to lie. <laughs> well, Hal Markowitz passed away a few years ago and he inspired a lot of people um, to think differently about how to do enrichment. Sort of a successor to his legacy is uh, one of our graduates, Dr. Jason Waters, who's at uh, San Francisco Zoo. He's vice president of wellness and animal behavior there. And he looks at um, the goal of enrichment as sort of turning on the environment, making the environment active so that the animal can take some control over its own life, decide when it eats, what, when it explores, as well as creating opportunities for it to explore and opportunities to find things in the environment. So um, this, was, this was a uh, feeder that they made for uh, kangaroos. Um, in all the stuff that he does, he tries to find things that are uh, kind of like what Markowitz did, easy to, to implement so that the uh, keeper doesn't have to do too much work, right? Because if they do, that they have enough to do and they won't do the enrichment, right? So this is a um, series of PVC pipes, as you can see, with a pie tin hanging at the bottom. And the way it works is you disassemble it, you take the pieces apart, and you put in these uh, pieces of ice. They actually 3D molded, 3D uh, printed these cups that are different heights, and they mold ice in there, and, and so then the ice goes into the pipe, and then you put pellets uh, for the kangaroos on top of that, and then screw the piece together and put another ice fuse on top of that and more pellets. And by varying the thickness of the ice, it varies how long it takes for the ice to melt through. And so then as you, you hang this in the exhibit, and as the ice melts, the pellets start dropping through into the pie tin and the kangaroos can find them. So they, the kangaroos are, are exploring their exhibit and at, at a very random basis, this uh, food is becoming available. So they keep coming back and, and checking to see if there's food in the thing. That blue and orange ball there is called a fubler, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, one of the things that they've done is just change exhibits to make them uh, more desirable for the animal. So this is, um, uh, they had two uh, polar bear exhibits, and what they did was they knocked the wall down between the two of them and modified it. So on the left-hand side, you see the, um, the typical exhibit, the old exhibit, a lot of concrete and a pool in there. On the right-hand side, it's uh, all dirt. And what they found was that the, the polar bear spends most of its time on the dirt side. And she has excavated a den. So she's dug a hole and she goes down in this den. And she, you know, she keeps digging it out and, and spending time in there. Here's a, here's a couple of polar bears at um, a zoo. This is actually a Copenhagen Zoo. And they have a pool to swim in. They don't have dirt to dig in. And you can see how they're, they're fairly white animals. Um, Jason says that they know that the polar bear is, is happy at San Francisco Zoo when it's filthy because 
she spent a lot of time down in that burrow in the dirt. So that denning behavior is a species typical behavior, uh, but we rarely uh, give polar bears the opportunity to do that. Another example is uh, for a giant anteater. Um, anteaters, of course, spend their time finding termite mounds, ant nests, and, and using those big claws to break them open. And, uh, and, and so I'll show you in a minute the enrichment they came up with. So here's um, another one of our residents. This is uh, an Anubis baboon or olive baboon named Olive. And she has a um, pretty unusual story in that she was, <laughs> let's see if she relaxes here. She, she doesn't like my voice on the microphone. Pretty good? Okay. Um, so in 1989, I think it was, right? 89, 88, something like that? 87. 87. Time flies when you're, 1987, um, she was born to a, uh, a wild baboon uh, that was a group of 30 baboons that were imported from Kenya into the United States. They came into Florida, and this was all legal. Um, the Department of the Interior checked on the animals when they came in and looked at, compared the group of animals to the permit that was issued for this. And the permit was for 30 adult baboons. Well, there was this one baboon, this female, that had this little baby clinging to her, and that was Olive. Okay. So the Department of the Interior, in their infinite wisdom, took Olive away from her mom. Um, they should have known better, I think. But they gave her to uh, Miami Metro Zoo, and Miami Metro Zoo tried to raise her as best they could. Um, but they pretty quickly realized that it was, it was uh, really demanding to give as much attention as was needed to this baby baboon. And so one of our graduates who worked there put him in touch with us, and, and so Olive came to California and came um, to America's Teaching Zoo here when she was about um, a year old. So as a consequence of missing out on that early contact with her mom, she came with a lot of problems, a lot of abnormal behavior. Um, probably the most disturbing of those, the most injurious, was actually hitting her head, either hitting her head with her hand or with a toy of her own, or even hitting her head against the, the wall of her cage or the floor of the enclosure or, or a toy. So, okay, cool. So what Cindy did with, um, and had the, the students do, this is one of those instances where um, your compassion can actually get in the way of what's good for the animal. So her trainers would see what's happening, see her engage in this abnormal behavior of hitting herself and, uh, of course, animal people are compassionate people and they felt bad for her and they would, so they would try and console her and try and, they would talk to her and try and encourage her to stop doing the behavior. Well, all that attention actually reinforced the behavior and made the behavior worse. So Cindy had to work with the students, the student trainers, and so that they could learn to ignore the behavior. Uh, and then wait for Olive to be calm, to not be hitting herself, and then they would immediately give her something else to do. Uh, ask her for another behavior or a toy to play with so they could reinforce the behavior different than the behavior of hitting herself. And so um, it was a long time, a long struggle of working with that, and she's still sensitive to changes in the environment. One of the times that we have to uh, be especially concerned is when a new group of first year students come into the zoo and we have a whole bunch of new people. You can see that uh, Olive has her troop here with her um, and 
uh, having these, these student trainers with her and Cindy's presence helps to reassure that things are going to be okay and that... Um, So, as you can see, she's pretty calm, and normally this would be a pretty stressful situation for an animal like this. It takes quite a while for the students to develop a relationship with the animal. She's um, not trusting right off the bat. You have to earn her trust uh, just by, by being consistent with her, offering her rewards, offering her things that she likes, um, and spending time with her. Okay. You can see that she's, um, she's uh, not real spry. She's an, definitely an elderly animal. She has a lot of fusion of her spine, um, uh, practically no cartilage in her knees. Um, and so um, it's amazing that she gets around as well as she does. Um, but she, uh, she seems to enjoy these walks uh, if, um, She's given a choice. She doesn't have to go on the walks. We don't have the animals do anything that they, they don't want to. And, uh, but she it voluntarily goes on these walks. She's given the opportunity to ride in a cart if she wants. Um, and sometimes she'll get tired and want to do that. But, but most of the time, she prefers to walk. She's, she's uh, taking it all in. She likes. Yeah. This is a. She recently got to come in here with uh, and meet Betty White. Um, we don't think that she was that Olive was too impressed with her, but she she did really enjoy the big grape that Betty got to feed her. So. <laughs> of course, why wouldn't you? Cindy, what are you feeding her? Uh, grapes and dates. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the, maybe the corn takes a little too much effort today when she wants to be looking around. She's missing a couple teeth, so it is a little bit harder for her to eat the corn. And the last time she came in here, she got really good food. So. Yeah. She wants to try to look through the viewfinder of the camera. So this is enrichment for Olive. The, um, this is getting out and, of course, walking is good for her physical health, but then getting out and experiencing, getting to, to go into new places, um, give some variety to her, her experience, and is stimulating to her. Learning new behaviors is also stimulating. So in the... In the wild, of course, the animals have to solve problems all the time to find the food that they need. Um, in captivity, we um, give them the food and, and they don't have to do that so much. So training can serve as a substitute for that by uh, teaching them 
to do different behaviors uh, and them having to figure out what it is that we want them to do is uh, uh, similar to that problem solving that they have to do to find, that they would have to do in the wild to find food. All right, thanks. She said, no, I'm, I'm comfy here. I like, I'm a star. Yeah. She's thinking about what's put on her Facebook page about this. <laughs> All right, so long. Thanks. All right. So I mentioned about the giant anteater. Um, so here's an enrichment device that Jason came up with for the anteater. Um, so on um, on the top there is that that black box with the green lid is a fish feeder. So it's an automated uh, device for for distributing pellets into a pond um, or in a, a hatchery. So inside that box is a, like, a, um, like a window shade. You pull it out and uh, that winds up the mechanism and then it gradually pulls that window shade to the back up to the front. It takes 12 hours for it to do that. And so in the morning, the keeper can pull that thing out and put food, different items of food, on that conveyor belt. And then the, when the food gets, when the belt gets to the front, the window shade gets to the front, the food drops off and can go down one of these three pipes. So by how they space the food across the belt, it varies which pipe it's going to go into and where the food is going to come out in the exhibit. So the uh, anteater can't predict where the food is going to show up, so it has to keep exploring to find that. Here's a, another example uh, that they're just trying to figure out. They're just, this is, this is uh, um, in the, they put this in their giraffe exhibit, the African savanna exhibit, and they are um, uh, taking, collecting data on it. So, um, that what this is, is just a, uh, an automatic deer feeder. So this is something that hunters put out to attract deer. So it has a mechanism in there to, to uh, distribute pellets for the deer. So what the San Francisco Zoo did was they got one of these things and they pulled the guts out of it basically and, and redid it. They had to change some things in it so it would accept the, the food for the giraffes that they needed to. And then they reprogrammed it so that it, it drops food down that long pipe and into the bucket uh, at the bottom. And the giraffes will hear the food drop into the bucket. And then the holes on the side of the bucket are there so the giraffe can come up and stick its tongue in, uh, which can be 18 inches long, um, and, and retrieve the pellet of food out. So they have a couple of these hung in the exhibit, different places, and they're experimenting with different uh, time frames, different intervals of uh, having food drop into the, into the bucket. And they're seeing how the animals, how much time the animals spend coming back to the bucket, checking and see if there's food there. Well, I mentioned that fubler, uh, that blue and orange ball. Well, the fubler is a an electronic toy for dogs. Um, so it, it has, um, what you do is you take the cap off and you put some treats in there, and it's six chambers inside, and then you close it up and you program it, and the, uh, your dog can push the thing around and at different intervals throughout the day, it'll open, it'll move and, and allow food to come out of the ball. And so um, the, the dog can't predict exactly when it's going to happen. They keep going back and checking, and they play with the ball. Well, Jason wondered if uh, maybe they, they could make a, one on a bigger scale for a bigger animal. And so they launched a uh, campaign on, this is experiment.com, and you can see they've raised the $15,000 that they needed 
so they're working with the company that made the Fubler to make a rhino-sized Fubler. So they're going to take a, um, a big jungle ball, it's an enrichment, it's just a big, really tough ball for animals like this, and it's, it's three feet in diameter, and they are modifying it with this Fubler mechanism inside so that the, um, the rhinos, which have already been shown to push balls like that around, um, they're now going to be able to have food come out of the thing every now and then, and that will encourage even more interest on the part of the rhinos in the, in the device. Okay. Well, another area of enrichment that has been tried here um, in, in recent years is uh, giving animals whole carcasses. Um, the, this is done as, a, as an alternative to giving the animals the processed foods that we typically use in zoos. Um, this, is, this is at the, uh, a zoo in Denmark where um, they do this a lot. Um, it is, it is, they're starting to do it here in the United States. It has been done at some zoos for quite a while. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, our people are a little more sensitive to this kind of thing here in this country. For example, at the Folsom Zoo and Sanctuary near Sacramento, they, one day a week, they do whole carcass feedings. Usually it's, it's uh, roadkill deer that, they, that the Department of Fish and Game provides them with. And they, so they put an announcement at the front of the zoo explaining what the whole carcass feeding is and why they do it and what exhibit it's at that they're doing it that day so that if you don't want to see it or don't want to expose your child to it, you don't have to. You can avoid that exhibit. But they've used this to, as enrichment for their mountain lions and wolves and uh, different big carnivores like this. This is a uh, banded mongoose. Um, and I think that's, I didn't get there. It, it was, this is about when I arrived, so I'm not sure what it's eating. <laughs> Maybe a rabbit. Um, this is at the Copenhagen Zoo, and these are Tasmanian devils, which, of course, are scavengers. And, um, the, so th they've been given a goat, a pygmy goat. Um, this was in the afternoon. That morning, that goat was walking around in their petting zoo. So they went and um, euthanized the goat in the morning and then gave it to the Tasmanian devils in the afternoon. Um, so the, um, this, of course, is a really controversial thing. Copenhagen Zoo also, um, a year ago, they had a young giraffe that was surplus to their collection. In other words, it was an animal that they didn't need for captive breeding, and um, it, its gene, the, its ancestry was well represented in the population of captive giraffes. And so the decision was made to euthanize the animal and feed it to their lions. Um, they have a, um, uh, a waiting list at the zoo. But like I said, this is there's some people who don't like this practice, but there's others of the community who have who've embraced it. And there's a waiting list of people who want to donate their old horses and cows to be fed out to the to the carnivores. Um, so it's really different, different idea, uh, and it's and it's not universally accepted. There are other zoos in Europe that are, who frown upon the practice. Um, the, um, uh, one of the zoos, this was back in April, I got to visit. One of the zoos, uh, this is another even more controversial practice than this whole carcass feeding or feeding animals from your collection to other animals in the collection, is that the, um, uh, the idea of allowing the animals to breed um, 
Now that may sound contradictory because of course we're trying to breed these animals to maintain them in the collection for conservation. But what I'm talking about is here in this country we, we don't, we try not to produce animals that we don't have places for. Right? We, we, we use contraception where we control access of males to females and so that we don't produce extra offspring that don't have a place to go. The zoos in Denmark have the philosophy that when we bring the animal into captivity, we are restricting its behavioral repertoire. It has, there's so much behavior that the animal does naturally, and when we bring it into captivity, we reduce that to a subset of behaviors that it can engage in. Well, by controlling breeding, like we do in this country, then we've, we've eliminated the opportunity for the animals to engage in a lot of cases in that behavior. And so what the, these Denmark zoos are arguing is that by allowing them to breed, then you give them back that opportunity to engage in that behavior. And that's enriching for the animals. It's good for their well-being. And then when the babies get old enough and there's no place for them to go, you euthanize the babies. Um, so like I said, it strikes a lot of people as the wrong thing to do. Um, the, um, an opinion expressed by Terry Maple, uh, who used to be the director of, of Zoo Atlanta and now works with the San Francisco Zoo, um, he expressed the opinion that he, think it, he thinks it's the wrong thing to do because the public looks upon zoos as a place to care for animals. And we want the public to trust us that we're going to do the right thing by these animals. Um, so by um, allowing excess breeding and then euthanizing the offspring, because there's no place for them to go, um, could, in, uh, could create the impression in some people's minds that we're really not caring for the animals as well as we, we should. And that could be damaging to the efforts of the zoos. People in Denmark, the zoo directors there would argue that, well, it's, it, by not allowing the, the animals to breed, we're damaging their well-being. So it's a, it's a controversial, emotional issue, and it's something, it's, something that um, people are talking about and trying to figure out what we should be doing. Thank you for your attention. Anyone have any questions? Yes? Wait. Let me uh, give you the microphone. So you... Hey, Sam, could you uh, handle the microphone when she's done? Um, is the behavioral enrichment as important for domesticated animals? So you have <clears throat> lots of times, um, especially in our society nowadays, people have pets at home and are at work all day long and the pets are left to their own devices. So um, that's why that Fubler was designed, it was really for domestic dogs. Um, so uh, it is important. Uh, I think it can be a challenge um, to provide our, our domestic animals with these things. I didn't talk about, I mean, even beyond this, there is, of course, um, Temple Grandin has been a, a champion of uh, welfare for animals that we um, are food animals, like cattle and, cattle and um, sheep and so forth. And so, looking at trying, so she has worked on trying to improve conditions in those places where those animals are kept so that we're, we're trying to provide a um, humane environment, uh, uh, an enriching environment for those animals so that their psychological well-being is, is in a good state all the way up until the point when we do euthanize them for, to use them as food. Yeah, so it is certainly, it is, um, it's, it's an area that's definitely important because it is easy for us to sort of discount those animals because of the use that they're being put to, that we're, they're just going to be, they're just going to die. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? 
All right. Thank you very much for coming.